Hello everyone, my name is Wafil and welcome to the fifth episode of Stress Explained – Magically Easy, a video series where I explain how and why different strats and glitches that speedrunners use work. Today we will be looking at a strat that crashes your game if you look at the car from the mission. That sounds mysterious, so let's find out what happens. In GTA 3 there is a mission called Evidence Dash. Your objective is to collect all of the evidence that is stored in a bobcat. At any given point you can obtain only one piece of evidence, which means that the mission goes like this. Chase the car, ram it, collect the evidence, chase the car again. The main issue with this mission is that the bobcat drives randomly, which means that you can lose a lot of time if you just get unlucky, even if you did everything perfectly. It is worth mentioning that there is an alternative strat that requires you using a tank. But that still doesn't help in a situation where the car decides to go away from you from the very beginning. Luckily there is one more strat that is actually used in all missions and 100% speedruns. It's called Dupe and Fail. I'll shortly remind you that all you have to do is start the same mission twice, then die or get busted. This will fail one instance and pass the other one. I already explained how and why this works in the very first episode of this series. And I highly recommend you to watch it if you haven't already, because otherwise there is a huge chance you won't understand some parts that I'm going to show you in this video. Back to the explanation. Pay attention to the camera Kamex chooses. He uses top-down camera to guarantee that the car will not be on his screen when he gets busted. As I said earlier, if you are looking at the Bobcat, then the game crashes. But why does it happen? Before I give you an answer to this question, I want to show you one more thing. I can already see some comments asking, but what happens in Definitive Edition? Well, let's check it out. In the first clip, we are going to be looking at the car to see if the crash is still present. The answer is yes. Alright, this time let's purposefully look away from the car. The result is… mission passed. So, we can conclude that this strat works exactly the same way in Definitive Edition as it does in the original game. So, why did it crash? To answer this question, I'm going to introduce to you a new tool, called Escarlock. All this program does is it locks all of your active scripts, each frame, and in the end you get a file that looks similar to the one on the screen. We are going to use this file to see what happened. Escarlock is a very useful tool, especially if you are testing various duping scenarios. Maybe you want to see what happens, why the game crashes, and can you avoid this crash etc, etc, etc. So, the first thing we can do is simply scroll to the very end of the file to see the commands that crashed our game. And here it is, place object relative to car. Now we can go to the binary and see what's wrong there. Here we are, place object relative to car. Let's see what happens here. First of all, we get an object from the object pool. Then we get a vehicle from the vehicle pool. Then we get an offset from the script parameters. And then we dump all of this into place physical relative to other physical. Let's assume that there is nothing wrong with the object and with the vehicle. Then it means that the issue is located inside of this function. But, as you can see, this function is not tied to our particular object and our particular vehicle. We pass them as parameters to this function. That means that we can use this function with any vehicle we want, with any object we want. And since that's the case, Chances are, if the issue was inside of this function, then it would be found long long time ago during the testing stage. So we can relatively confidently guess that the issue is with either the object, or the vehicle, or even with both. Something doesn't exist when we use this command. What can it be? Let's first answer this question. The vehicle is obviously the bobcat we have to chase in the mission, and the objects are the pieces of evidence we have to collect. Good. What else can we get from the log? Let's see. I'll scroll until the start of the frame for this script. It's indicated by this header that has a script name, some local variables, etc, etc, etc. So, first of all, the game checks if the car is dead, and the answer is false. So, the car is actually alive during that frame, and now we know that when the game crashes, the car is alive, evidence isn't. Ok, but why is that? From the first episode we know that everything that gets on the cleanup list – cars, objects, pedestrians, all of that 
gets removed from it basically simultaneously. So why does it take different amount of time in game for Bobcat and Evidence to disappear? Hmm. To answer this question we'll have to go back to the source code, but before I do that I want to say a few more words about Escrolog. As you can see, if we read the commands it's pretty easy to understand what is going on. Is car upside down? Is car stopped? But then we can read something like is int var equal to number 1? And that is where it gets confusing. So yeah, from this one we can understand that we have some variable of type integer and we compare it to number 1, but we don't know what that variable is. What does it mean? Why is there a comparison in the first place? Like what does it do? It's impossible to understand from the log only. And that's why I think it's best to use the log and the source code together. Because in the source code we can easily get the variable name, we can also get proper car names instead of these number identifiers. Let me quickly show it. We're back at GTA modding.ru. The link is in the description. By the way, every time there's something important I talk about or show on my videos, more information is always available in the descriptions for these videos. Please read them. Okay, let's go to the third race mission and scroll to the action. First of all, we create a car, car bobcat, and the name of the variable is IACARRM3. Okay, then we create some objects, evidence 1, evidence 2, evidence 3, and so on. Here's the first time our evidence gets tied to our car using place object relative to car command. And then we have our main loop that we saw in the logger. First check, is car dead? We already know the answer, the car isn't dead. Is car upside down or stopped? No, it isn't. Here is our mysterious variable, if timer A reset flag equal to 1. From the name alone we don't really get that much information, but if we simply keep reading we'll understand everything. Look, if the car is stopped and our flag is not set, we set the timer A to 0 and set our flag to 1. If the timer A is more than 5000, so 5 seconds, and our flag is set, then we check if the car is on the screen. If it's not, so if the player doesn't look at the car, then we can easily respawn it on the road and nobody will notice. See? It wasn't that hard. What I want to tell you is that use loggers, use source codes, use all of the tools that are available to you to get the maximum amount of information from your particular situation. It'll help you to get the answers you're looking for. Let's move on. Ok, back to RE3, class C mission cleanup, function process. We've already seen this one, and I'll remind you that this function is called in our case when we fail the mission. In the first episode we looked at this for loop, but we didn't look into any of these functions. This time we'll have to, and let's start with cars. So when we clean up the car, we call clean up this vehicle. Inside, first of all, we check that we have the vehicle and that it was created by a mission, so it's a mission vehicle. This is our case because the Bobcat was created by the mission. So, first of all, we say that is locked is now false. Locked doesn't mean like door lock. It means that the car is locked by the mission script and therefore it cannot be removed from the game. Now we say no, it's no longer locked, so if we need to remove this car, now we can do it. Then we remove it from the interesting vehicle list, this is the list of your personal vehicles, and we say that now vehicle created by is random vehicle. Remember this value, we'll come back to it later. Ok, let's go back. What happens to objects? What happens to evidence? We call clean up this object, first of all we have the same checks, and then we say that the object is now a temporary object. Ok, so what does use this temp object value? For that I'm going to press Shift F12, that is going to bring this search window, let me make it a bit bigger. As you can see there are a lot of matches and I went through every single one and I know that the one we are interested in is this one, case temp object. Why this one you might ask? Well, it's because it's located in the function can be deleted and that is logical. When you want to delete an object, you first want to check if you can delete it. In our case, temp object, we see return true, which means that yes, we can delete this object. Cool. What uses this function? 
once again, shift plus F12. This time we don't have that many matches, we are interested in the last one, and we get into manage population. Okay, what happens here? Here we first of all get the object pool size. It is 450 slots long, so it is quite a big one. Then we have a for loop that goes through all of these 450 slots. As you can see, it doesn't go from the first slot to the last one. It uses some math here, and why is that? Well, processing 450 potential objects in just one frame is quite hard for the game. And especially it was back in 2001. So, instead of processing every single slot in just one frame, we're going to do it by chunks. So, the first frame we're processing the first 14 objects the next one, the next 14 objects, then the next 14, and so on, until we process every single one. But instead of doing it in one frame, we just do it in 32 frames, which is much much better for the game performance. So yeah, that's an important optimization, or at least it was back in the day. Alright, what happens here? First of all, we try to get an object from the slot. If the object exists and it can be deleted, which is our case, evidence exists and we can delete it. We check the distance between the object position and the player. If it's less than 80, then we go here, but we know that objects are quite far away from us, they're basically on the other side of the map, so we definitely know that the distance is more than 80 units. So we get into this branch here. First of all, we check if the object is a temp object, and yes, we've already seen that. And if so, we just remove it from the world and delete it from the game completely. Cool. So this is where all of the objects, in our case evidence, gets deleted. In the worst case scenario, this process is going to take 32 frames, which is roughly a second, a little bit more. Okay. Let's see what's next. What calls this function? For that I'm going to press Shift plus F12 again, choose the first result here. We end up in C population update. I'm going to use the search now, and we finally end up in another interesting place. This is C game process. Why is it an interesting place, you might ask? Well, pay attention to these functions. Most of them are basically update functions. Update, another update. So this is the function that is basically updating mostly everything that is in the game like weather, clock, etc, etc, etc. If I scroll to the very bottom, we'll find a very interesting entry. See car control, remove distant cars. And our bobcat is definitely a distant car, because it's far away from us. So let's go inside. Here we have another for loop that goes through every single slot in the vehicle pool list. The vehicle pool isn't that big, so we don't use any optimizations, we just go one by one and process everything in one frame. First of all, once again, we try to get the car from the slot. If it doesn't exist, we go to the next slot. If it does exist, then we go and call possibly remove vehicle. So this function doesn't guarantee that we're going to remove the vehicle. Let's see what happens inside. Inside, first of all, we find our player position. OK. And then we hit a lot of different checks. So let's go and see what happens there. First of all, we see if the vehicle is an interesting vehicle, and we already know it isn't, because we change this value in the cleanup. We check if it's a locked vehicle, and we know no, it's not a locked vehicle. Once again, in the cleanup we remove this flag. Can the vehicle be deleted? Okay, let's see. How does this check work? Let's scroll to the very bottom, and in case random vehicle, we return true. Remember when I said that this value will appear a little bit later? Here it is. So if the vehicle is a random vehicle, we can remove it. Which is once again our case. Alright. Next, we check if this car is being targeted by any crane. In our case, no, of course. So we end up here. Once again, another check. If the vehicle fading out. By default, this flag is set to false, so we do not go inside. Instead, we go here. And here we find the distance to the player, so distance between our player and the vehicle. And we set a threshold. 
50 units, but since the vehicle is on the screen, we actually increase this threshold to 130 multiplied by generation dist multiplier. This is 1, so in the end the threshold is 130. And we know for sure that our Bobcat is way further than that, because 130 is not that much. Ok, here we check if the distance between our player and our vehicle is more than threshold, and it is. Then we see that the car isn't inside of any hideout garages, and it obviously isn't. We check if it's on the screen, yes, we are looking at it. And then we check this weird function. Why is it weird? Well, because I'm not really sure what it does. It's not that easy to understand from the code, but I use cheat engine and confirm that this function returns true in our situation every single time. So we actually end up going here and we set that B fade out flag to true. If we are not looking at the car, by the way, then we just remove it from the world and from the game completely, immediately. And that is what happens when we don't look at the vehicle and the game doesn't crash. But if we do look, then yeah, we set this B fade out flag. We already have seen it here. What does it do? Like, what is fading out? Let me find the relevant function real quick. Okay, here it is. So there is this value called clump alpha. By default, when the car is opaque, when the car is visible, it's 255. And if we set this flag, then we start to decrease it by 8 every single frame until it becomes 0. So, all in all, this process takes 32 frames, which is, once again, a little bit over than a second. If you're not sure what fading out means, then when you get far away from a car and you look at it, it starts to disappear right in front of your eyes until it becomes fully transparent. If the B fade out flag is set and the clump value finally becomes zero, then we remove the car from the world and delete it from the game. And as I said, this process takes 32 frames every single time. So let's sum it up. If we are looking at the vehicle when we fail the mission, then it's going to take 32 frames to disappear. Objects, in our case evidence, however, are going to disappear way, way quicker. It can happen on basically any frame. In the worst case scenario, as I said, it might also take 32 frames, and I think there is a slim chance that if it happens, then maybe the game will not crash. But to find that out, we need to check the function call order, and to be fair, there is no point, because first of all, the chances are extremely slim, and second, we have a proper method of avoiding the crash. Alright, this is everything I wanted to tell you today, so if you still have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments, and I'll try to help you. Today's challenge is answering the following question. Why when I started Evidence Dash for the second time, the first piece of evidence dropped from the car automatically, without me touching it at all? I'll give you a hint. Reading the source code alone should be enough to answer this question, but if you also use logs, then it'll be much, much easier. A poll for the next topic is going to appear on the community tab in roughly 3 days after this video goes live. I will also put a link to it in the pinned comment. Thank you all for watching! If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, and if you don't want to miss the next episode, consider subscribing. My name is Wafil, and I'll see you the next time.